everybody, and welcome to a Wednesday afternoon here on Cobalt Press's Twitch channel. I see you, Raiders. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Gen Con TV, for sharing the love. We are just getting started, and today I'm super excited. One, because y'all know I got beans to spill, uh, because it's Cobalt Chat Day, and we have to spill beans. And two, because we're sitting down with uh, the designer of the Scarlet Citadel, which just hit market. So... I'm going to save announcements for the end because I'm really hyped to like just dive right in. So um, I'm Dot. If you're new uh, to Cobalt Press, take a moment. Follow the channel so you know when we go live again. We've got actual plays happening over here. Um, we do all kinds of chats and talks with designers and writers and artists of our content and our products. And today we are here with Steve Winter. Steve, um, thanks for coming to chat. No, oh, my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so... In case all these lovely folks sitting over here in chat don't know, uh, maybe tell us who you are and, um, well, what is your involvement with, with Kobo Press? Uh, well, so uh, I've been around this uh, role-playing business for a long time. I uh, got started in 1981, back when uh, D&D was still being put out by TSR in uh, Wisconsin, and uh, I've been doing it ever since in one form or another. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, so, I mean, I knew, I, I knew Wolf from when we were both at TSR. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we both wound up uh, out here in Seattle and Wolf has been, you know, ramping up uh, Kobold Press slowly over the years. And I've, I've, you know, been doing things for Kobold for quite a, quite a few years, uh, at least 10 years, I guess. I've been wow. contributing one way or another, done a lot of the little uh, had a lot of entries in the Kobold Guide to Whatever books, which are, uh, <laughs> which are the best books. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, my GM yeah. life always needs a little guide here and there. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of work on Deep Magic and mm. uh, uh, the uh, Southlands, uh, uh, Southlands Heroes Handbook, or not Southlands, uh, Midgard Heroes Handbook. And, uh, Another must have. Yep, yeah, a lot of a lot of Midgard stuff, and then Scarlet Citadel. Nice. So. And you talked Deep Magic. We actually chatted about Deep Magic last night and some of the Deep Magic spells that are actually a part of Scarlet Citadel. Um, I feel like some of them are listed in there. And um, I love Deep Magic because it gives a lot of really awesome spells for druids, which oftentimes get the short end of the literal stick. <laughs> um, so uh, it's always nice to have like a compendium of new things for druids. Uh, and I, I really love Deep Magic. So that's very, very cool. Well, uh, we celebrated actually our 15th anniversary uh, just a few months back uh, while we were all in our, our quarantine. Uh, so to think that you've been here 10 of 15 is pretty impressive uh, with Cobalt, which is really, really cool. So, um, all right. So we're we're here to actually talk about the newest product uh, that has come out to all of our Kickstarter backers. So if you backed Scarlet Citadel, you should have your digital copies. Hard copies are coming. Does Steve has a... <gasps> Steve has a hard copy. Look at it. That's the really... Okay, I was talking about this one last night, how beautiful I thought the limited edition oh, book was. <laughs> it's so beautiful, the limited edition book, um, with that, like, inlaid uh, stamping, like the red... Sta it's... Y'all. Uh, so I, hard copies oh, are coming. When Wolf gave me that, I was told this is one of only two copies in North America right now. So, well, you heard it. You seen it here first on Cobalt Chats, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> That's I awesome. have it. One of you. <laughs> So, uh, but if you are a Kickstarter backer, the other things are out. I believe also the codes for your VTT, so your Roll20, your Fantasy Grounds, or your Shard, if you're backing Shard, um, is also out for you. And you know what, y'all? If you don't have it, don't fret. You can get it. Uh, I see that Stridergate's been in chat dropping a link to the Cobalt Press Store where this is now available for you to grab. I think there's like the PDF version, all of your VTT licenses are there, and there's like a map pack of like 28 maps as well. Um, so you can get all kinds of neat things over on the Cobalt Press Store, so check that out. Um, now, I have to know, because we had this long conversation last night, uh, like two GMs just sitting down talking Scarlet Citadel. Uh, and one of the things that V, who is the GM running it here on the channel, loves about this campaign in particular is that it's very easy to, um, even though it's a dungeon crawl, it doesn't feel like a dungeon crawl. Right? And I want to talk about that because I think that that is something that's really special about Scarlet Citadel that I love. That there's this kind of ebb and flow where, like, once you're in the dungeon, you can leave again. Uh, we talked about some of the uh, NPCs and characters you meet. It's not just hack and slash, right? Like, sometimes you might actually have to maybe talk to a thing. <laughs> uh, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's that's really all the best 
dungeon crawls. Um, the, it, the, the dungeon is an environment, right? It, mm. It's and and particularly a place like the Scarlet Citadel. There are there are, I mean, very small, obviously, but societies that live inside this place, and it's their home, right? Mm-hmm. And when you when you come in, and they're not necessarily just always on a war footing, right? They're not just sitting around waiting to be invaded. They're, they have things to do. <laughs> they right, have their right, own, right. They're, they're their doing own, their thing. <laughs> they have their own objectives and goals and ambitions. Um, and so when you show up, uh, you know, a lot of them are there to impede your progress. And some of them don't really care one way or another. Some of them are there. I mean, there are even other groups inside the Citadel who are there largely for the same reason you are. They're just there looking for loot and, and blood. Yeah, so, right they're just they're just adventurers they're just trying to get yeah, theirs yeah uh, not necessarily uh, human adventurers but that's what they're there for so. yeah well hello shard tabletop we were just talking about you welcome in everybody thanks for being with us um okay so that's you know and like i said it's one of the interesting things because i've heard people say oh i even got people in chat right now that's like oh i just cracked it open i can't wait to like play it with my home game or i can't wait to like run this dungeon i'd love to hear more about the process of creating a dungeon like this because let's be real the the this this tower the red tower is is no small like you got what there's like eight or nine levels am i correct in thinking well there's six six six, levels. six. Okay. Are, plus the are, town yeah. yeah yeah plus the town but now there are eight or ten i forget the exact number maps right because some of the levels are bigger than others right um, some of them are double sized but uh uh, but yeah, it, it, well, and then if you throw in, of course, the castle, the ruined castle. The above, ruined castle. Okay, yeah. So I was accounting. Well, but, okay. And actually, I take it back because if there are a couple of expansion levels as well. Oh. So if you, if you count the, the, the ruined fortress above, the six main levels, and the two expansion levels, now you're up. I did back. have my nine. Hey, yeah. Dawn was listening. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, so um, this is actually, I just showed everybody in chat. This is m- one of my favorite images from the entire book. I love this side image of the stacked, uh, like, levels or uh, of the of the dungeon. I just think it's such a cool image. Um, but, yeah, so wh- where, do, where does one start d- developing this? I mean, this is obviously rooted in Midgard lore, but also can kind of go into any 5e game, I feel like. You can put the tower just about anywhere you want and working into your home game but where did you where did you start where did the inspiration come from um well this was uh, we went about this one a a little bit differently from the typical design in that uh, i mean uh, the the basic core of it came from wolf and from midgard with the idea of the scarlet citadel as a place and the town of red tower as a as a place Mm -hmm. and a lot of the history um Wolf wrote up a a very kind of rough history of the Citadel and sent that to me. And then I went through and kind of pulled things out and said, all right, I really like this. We can do a lot with this. Uh, This is, you know, kind of vague. I don't understand where you're going. I basically, (laughs) they gave him a lot of notes, a lot of feedback on on that idea. Um, And then working together, we sort of fleshed out that outline quite a bit more. uh, but then where it really, and I mean, that process is pretty standard for a project like this, um, where we did it a little bit differently. And this was uh, when I worked on uh, the big adventure Tomb of Annihilation for Wizards of the Coast a few years ago. One of the things we did there that was very different and that I really liked, and and so I suggested it to Wolf and he liked the idea too. And we went with it. And that was that um, I, as a designer, did not draw the maps. Uh, Really, we came up with a list of what needed to be on each level. And we turned that over to the cartographer and said, you generate the maps. And this is the kind of thing that it, the friends, uh, my friends who work in video game design ha- have said the same thing. It's when you turn something like that over, uh, I'm, I'm, man, I, I, my conversation is all over the place here. No, no, I, you're good. This is great. I'm, I'm, I'm enthralled. This is really cool. The, the idea being like in computer games, the most of the best level designers are artists because they think visually rather ah, than mm-hmm. story, right? So you get much more dramatic looking levels when... Uh, they're designed by artists 
And so that's kind of the idea here too. When yeah. we turn this to a cartographer, somebody who actually thinks in terms of maps and what makes a map really interesting, mm -hmm. then we get back, it has the elements we wanted, but you know, it's a it's as much of a surprise to me as it is to anyone else. The yeah. first time. And now I get to take those ideas of the cartographer and feed those back into the the ideas that I'm putting into the design. And um, and on both Tomb of Annihilation and this project, I found that was a uh, it's it's a, a terrific pro process because it makes me as the writer think about things in a different way than mm -hmm. I would if I'm just, you know, when you're, especially when you're pressed for time and on a project like this, you're always pressed for time. Um, and so you tend to fall back on patterns and well, <laughs> what's gonna make this easiest for me to write? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what's gonna, how can I approach this so that I can get the maximum number of words done in the next five days, right? <laughs> um, which is not, necessarily <laughs> the, very, the best approach for coming up with a really interesting adventure right in fact it kind of works against it so when you're when you're feeding off of somebody else's ideas that are, and it, it, this is always true it's been true you know going back to the er, earliest years i worked at tsr the the best products come out of collaborations right i don't really buy into the auteur theory of game design um any more than i do in filmmaking right because yeah. it's, it's something that it Tons of people are having input into this process, and the more um, the more you give that free reign, and the more you build on each other, the better it's going to be. So. Yeah, I love that. That's really really interesting. And to think that I don't know, it almost makes more sense. Like, why wouldn't you have the cartographer be the person to like lay out and then hand it back? That almost seems like a no brainer. Um, to think that it now that work. I've done yeah. a couple projects this way, I, I, I kind of like, I want to do all my projects. Yeah, all of them like that. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Uh, chat says it's kind of like a, a, a creative feedback loop, uh, you know, yeah. like back and forth and back and forth. And, and you build off of each other instead of kind of completion and passing and passing down the line, uh, which is really, really neat. Um, I like that a lot. That's very, very cool. Well, and chat also pointed out the maps are incredible. Um, the larger like maps inside of the book uh, really... Um, yeah, no, really, they're, they're... really, really interesting. Last night we were talking because I had V, our GM, tell me like what was her favorite. But there was this unanimous across the board that level two of the dungeon seems to be everybody's favorite. Um, I, I don't know why, because I told them I didn't want spoilers since I'm actually a player in these <laughs> campaigns. I was like, please don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. Um, but level two seems to be the, the, the most, the one that everybody's most interested in. Well, level uh, yeah. two is definitely the... Uh the most wahoo of all of the levels. That, that's that, kind of what I would say. It's like nuts. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of weird things going on in the Scarlet Citadel, but level two has a, a higher concentration of weirdness than most of the other. A ones. higher concentration. You heard it here first, everybody. <laughs> I love it. Um, chat, we are going to take questions, by the way. So if you've got them, uh, you can start dropping them now. We'll kind of work our way through as we as we keep talking or if they, they come up organically. Uh, level two is so sweet. You are right. Um, all right, neat. Yeah. And uh, so, okay. So you sat down with this idea. Wolfgang kind of gave you the Midgard side of things. You brought your stuff. You went to a cartographer and then you came back. Um, last night, we chatted about the NPCs in this campaign and how interesting the GM felt like the NPCs really, really were. Um, do you have a favorite? Do you have like a favorite thing? You, uh, a person, uh, I guess I could say creature, um, individual uh, that you put, you put in this? Um, you know, I, no, I, I would not say I have a favorite, but I, I did like all of them, right? Okay. Uh, I think, I mean, there's, uh, so there's a, there are kind of two different layers of uh, NPCs here. There's, there are NPCs who are, who are in the employ, if you want to call it that, <laughs> of the main the main boss villain at the bottom mm -hmm. of the dungeon um, and who are, they're sort of seated throughout the dungeon to keep an eye on things for him. Um, and so there's that level. And then there's the NPCs who are just, who just live here, right? This is, this right, is, this is just their home. They're just chilling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, and um, I, I guess if I had to pick one or the other, I, I kind of prefer the ones who are not related to the main villain because they have their agenda is entirely their own, right? And so you can do whatever you want with them. Um, the you know the, the the two or the three who actually work directly for the main villain, um, they're they're kind of beholden to him, obviously. Yeah. Although I had a little bit of fun with them too, in that. I mean, they, they both have their own thing going on, right? Yeah, they, uh-huh. sort of, they, they work for the main villain because because he's bigger and tougher than they are. And if they if they don't kind of follow what he wants, he may not let them stay here and continue doing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So, um, I was going to see if I mean, I could pull you know, The Alchemist is a lot of fun just because she's so completely whacked out of her head. Yeah, nuts. Uh, I was actually going to try to see if I couldn't pull up the sanatorium, some of the the images of that map in particular and we had a great question uh the maps were done by john pintar right yes I, yes yes um so uh, that was our, our cartographer uh for this one um and though we had a lot of interior artists as well like uh, the additional interior art was done by another collective group of artists as well you know cobalt press has so many great artists on um pintar is from somewhere in europe I, believe. Uh, I think that's correct uh i believe that is correct um here's that um an alchemist floor level just so intricate and beautiful um so we oh we did have a question curious your favorite trap it is a dungeon there's got to be a couple good traps Do you have a favorite trap you you came up with for the for this uh particular campaign yeah. um oh, what do you think it would probably be uh on level three there there aren't there's not a huge amount of traps in in this dungeon or, that makes me uh, very happy of, as a player. <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, traps. I when I back in the early, you know, when I was much younger playing D and I really loved traps. And and as I've, you know, now that I have what forty five years of playing D and D behind me, um, <laughs> it, I, I'm not nearly as enamored of traps anymore as I used to be because they're 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 kind of a passive experience, right? Uh, traps. It's like. It, what is the point of a trap? Is it simply to inflict damage? Well, that, that's not very interesting, right? The point of it, the, the most interesting trap is a trap that you find mm. and then figuring out how to avoid it becomes a puzzle. Right, correct. Yeah. Um, but I, I would say in, in Scarlet Citadel, the most interesting traps by far, I think, are on level three because level three is... Um, and again, I, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but level three is a just a battlefield. Um, if 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 there are TPKs in this dungeon, oh. and there will be, they will happen on level three, um, because level three is I mean almost the whole level is a death trap, but not. I mean, it's not the kind of death trap you think of when you think death trap. But, right. but there are those it, kinds of death there, traps. It's there, it's there. I'm not there nervous, are, Chad. Did y'all see my face? I was like, uh. <laughs> oh, there are places, if you step in and trigger this trap, it's just going to knock everyone out, and then the bad guys are going to come in and cut everyone's throat, and that's the end of, of that party, right? Um, there are places where you're going to step on a plate, and it's going to Put a spear through you and when you take another step it's going to trigger a play then drop the ceiling on you and when you take another step it's going to wow go up your head right it, it's a it, I'm not that, nervous. it's a meat grinder level three is a meat grinder and Dang. i have i had to put uh, i'm very proud of level three i think it's a very cool level but it's a very old school kind of level and yeah. i was really worried writing it and i have a lot of caveats to the gm <laughs> at the beginning of that level saying uh, there are, I'm sure there is an entire generation of gamers out there of, of D and D players who have never encountered a level like this and they are going to approach it the way they approached level one and level two, and they're going to die. Wow. No oh. right? so you, you've got to just as GM, you you've got to have a very upfront discussion with people at the beginning and say, you know, there are you are going to encounter things in this dungeon you cannot fight up. You cannot just do a frontal assault on. They will kill you if you do that. Um, and I mean, this is even the kind of thing where just 
if you go into level three and you run into trouble and you retreat to level two, that's not going to save you. They're going to chase you. The, you know, the things on level three want you dead and they are going to hunt you almost to the walls of Red Tower wow. in order to, uh, to get rid of you. So uh, yeah, this is, it, it's a nasty, nasty level. Well, that's really interesting because, you know, uh, somebody in chat here brought up the idea. Of, I mean, and it's true, like there is a... I'm guessing you could always retreat back to Red Tower and try to do some recuperation between floors. But hearing that that floor three is like a no go on that front, like floor three is like <laughs> a be all end all. Um, I yeah, wow. Although I will, I I also put a little bit of a safety valve in there for GMs, which I'm which I'm very pleased with because there's the option that uh, if if characters acquit themselves well in the fight, even if they lose, they can be taken prisoner because the things on level three admire oh. valor, right? Oh. So, you know, they, they may just take you prisoner and you can wind up being prisoners of these things for months. And there's a kind of a little set of, a little subsystem in there for sort of befriending some of them, winning their admiration oh. and trust potentially you can convince one of them to you know unlock you and let you escape or see now that is very cool because i mean tpks are great and as a gm the occasional tpk is really satisfying <laughs> but but i love this idea that there's you know for those tables of players that really uh prefer a role play heavy or an opportunity to try to f what i call the finagling they like to finagle their way out of problems uh that's very encouraging because i think uh you know one way is not always best way so that's kind of cool it's cool to hear that like you could almost end up on an entirely different adventure trying to just escape being a prisoner um you know death death is so easy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and like like a trap that does damage death is not an interesting outcome in situations like this right you, you you don't want to if all you do is kill a character that's the end right it's right. much more interesting to continually put them into worse and worse trouble yeah <laughs> right? yeah like just just dig let them dig that hole even deeper right uh yeah, yeah i think yeah. that's so yeah. neat um, all right. We, well, we've got a lot of chatter coming through now. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, chat saying uh, there's a lot of fans out there that have been thirsting for a really classic kind of dungeon crawl. And I think what's really cool about I'm finding about Scarlet Citadel is literally layer by layer. It's like, well, layer three has that like really um, treacherous, uh, like two-y, like second edition vibe of just like dragging yourself from one into the other uh, you may not make it and then there's like this really weird thing uh you know that, that happens on uh, the second level and so it's a, it's a really neat dungeon crawl i think it has a lot of um uh yeah a lot of uniqueness and diversity inside of it which is really neat so um there is no pause button or reset on level three you you're totally right um and for those of you that don't use VTTs, we got another great point brought up. There's a wonderful um, tutorial inside of the Roll20 pack that walks you through using the multiple layers. Uh, so you can show the hidden stuff. You can show this thing or that thing. So that's a nice little handy um, uh, addition as well. That, um, and that, that's actually one of the things about the maps in this that I, I had a lot of fun with because it has it has the overlays. Uh -huh. So the map can actually change mm -hmm. uh, as uh, as the adventure progresses and you know some of those were like mm, how are we going to do this but you know it's like oh wow well, i can i can have this entire room collapse <laughs> yeah i was going to say so um maybe give uh everybody an example of one of those environmental changes right because there's a couple um and in the it's really easy in a digital map to be like slap on new layer but like uh i think it's a really neat aspect to the game um you know to have a map change around you well and the ones that i'm the most proud of and that I'm most looking forward to actually getting to use when, uh, you know, when I sit down to, to run this game with the big maps is there's a level where um, the things that live there brew a potion that allows them to, I think I called it a potion of augmented reality or something like that. When, when they drink this potion, it, it, it alters your view of reality. It essentially lets Whoa. you see things it, it, it allows it kind of allows your vision to cross into another dimension and and once you can see the things that are there 
you can use them, you can interact with them. And so uh, there are, uh, in fact, I think it's almost, well, it's not impossible, but it's very, very difficult to get through that level if you're not using that potion, um, because there are, uh, there are just a lot of features of that level that you have no access to if you're not access to this alternate dimension yes yeah. uh so. chat says i think i took a potion like that when i was a teenager <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know i i was as i was writing it it, it kind of occurred to me I, I hope this is not like crossing a line into you know promoting I mean, as long as they get a choice to take it right like as long right, as there's yeah. the, they get the choice to drink it or not drink it. Right. but i think that's you know that's also very cool of, like just seeing um giving your players a chance to see more than they're going to see like without it. Right. I just think that's a really, really cool, uh, really yeah, cool it, thing. It, the potion is brewed for a different sort of biology. Than right. Biology. So these potions can have some we pretty weird side effects as well, that some are good and some are bad, but, um, but the fact that it gives you true sight <laughs> is, is yeah, a, that's kind of, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. I, I really dig that. I think that's really, really neat. Um, yeah, you had mentioned like collapsing walls. Um, somebody in chat mentioned the triggering of like simultaneous encounters, right? So something in another room may get triggered when you do a thing, which is kind of cool uh, oh, yeah. as well. So yeah. I think that's really Even, really even cool. though, the, I mean, these are big maps, it's still at a, at a scale of, you know, one inch equals five feet. Uh, you're never that far away from everything else on the level. So right. if, you, if, if you cast, you know, a thunder wave spell or something, it's going to reverberate pretty much through the whole level. Right. Um, through the whole thing. Mm, interesting. Um, now, this is a great question. So besides Wolfgang's outline, right, which really come, that's that's that deep Midgard, what other sources of inspiration might you have drawn from in designing an adventure like this? I mean, you've talked about, you've been playing for a very, very long time, so I imagine there's got to be some additional inspiration you brought to the table. Yeah, um, interesting. I mean, I'm a big fan of, you know, pulpy fantasy stories um there's there's some definite uh there's some definite lovecraft in there that, you know there are there are touches of cosmic horror in some places um there's a, a there's uh there's a very it, it's a very small part of the adventure but it's actually probably the, my favorite part of the adventure is a, a trip through time um, oh Characters wind up um, seeing the, and it, it's kind of like the time machine, right? Where you, you stay in one place and time progresses around you, huh. and uh, and it, if uh, if things go, you know, I guess depending on your perspective, if things go well or things go really badly, characters can wind up in this unimaginably distant future where you know reality is not at all what we know it to be. Um, but uh -oh. I mean, I, I love that. <laughs> I just got sweaty hearing you say that. I'm like, oh my God, okay, okay, okay. What, what don't I touch when I play through this? Um, <laughs> that's very, very cool. Um, yeah, void magic. Uh, we talked a little bit about the void magic situation uh, last night, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. I'm playing a Darrow uh, who saw the void as a child in the mouth of a goat in which his parents <laughs> was attempting to feed him too. So uh, I'm very excited to get to the void magic part of this because um, I definitely think my little crazy Darrow's in it for the power. I'm just there for the power. Um, but yeah, it is It is really, really neat. Um, and a, a Darrow PC will have a very interesting time on certain levels of this adventure. This is going to be, yeah. I, I'm really, he, he rides the same goat he was going to be fed to. So he rides, he rides a K, he rides the cave goat. Uh, so this, it'll be very, it should be very fun. It'll be a, a neat little uh, different view. Cause I was like, I could play a human or I could play somebody that's like really in it for the adventure. Or I could play a crazy Darrow who is like not exactly sure where they are most of the time <laughs> or how they even got here. Uh, it should be interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would. Uh, I would love to run this adventure for somebody who's playing a Darrow PC. Yeah, so. yeah, I'm playing. I I have been holding out on a Darrow character because I really love that race like a lot. Um, and I've played a lot of my other favorite Midgard races or like my favorite uh, Cobalt Press races, including you know the Arena because I got to get my Hedgehog folk in there. But um, I felt like of all the campaigns that I could possibly run a Darrow in, this had to be 
this had to be the one. I was like, this one deserves a Darrow character. So we've got all kinds. We got a piney. We got a mushroom folk that's going down there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be. We've got Gear Force. It's a very strange uh, and a Tabaxi. Uh, I think it's a very strange group uh, that is seeking out yeah. the secrets of the Some of them, They're gonna they're gonna be walking into a situation where it's gonna be like, well, on this level. I feel right at home and all the rest of you are prey. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the rest of you are done for. Uh, so yeah, it should, it's very cool. It should be, it should be a lot of, a lot of fun actually. Um, so yes, uh, so time travel, there are a few items, correct? Like timey wimey items. I know there's the potion. I was looking through some of the magic items last night. We kind of got into this, but I didn't want to spoil anything, uh, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, because I've got it in front of me. So there are a couple really cool magic items. Do you have a favorite magic item that was like brought into this specifically? Mm, boy, I'd have to refresh my memory. I was about memory. to say, I'm looking, because I mean, okay, so, okay, there are a few timey-wimey items, right? Yeah. There's like the time, the time construct. Um, yeah, there's um, also a, yeah. a couple other really cool. The, uh, let's see. Well, yeah. oh, the, I, I would say my favorite magic item of all of them is the the, the potion of gelatinous form, um, because that's just, you know a potion that turns you into ooze. <laughs> it's just too cool. To that not is use. very cool. Plus, I mean, like think about think about the escape options. Like I'm immediately like, how could I use it? Like you could. If stuff's getting really bad, you could flush yourself. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you, could, mm -hmm. you could get out. That's the that's very very cool. I like that. Um, tight spaces there there i knew there were a couple of weapons there's like the unquiet dagger which i thought was really really interesting um yes that's and again that's a, a you know as it has ties to uh to leng which is you know, again uh, one of those weird sort of cosmic horror uh -huh. kind of things. so uh, yeah the the unquiet dagger is a definite uh you know yeah, I like that weapon. On, using, <laughs> using that weapon. I, I, I really, when I design magic items, um, I am not a power gamer at all. Me neither. And I really have very little interest in magic items that do nothing but make you tougher. I, mm -hmm. I want magic items that have an interesting history um, or, or that, that do things other than just give you bonuses to combat or do more damage or do a unique kind of damage. Yeah. I, I, I want a magic item that it really becomes a part of your character. And so that's sort of what I was going for. Yeah, there, there are a couple of those. I mean, I'm always a fan of like, you know, bards sometimes don't like, there's, there's a musical instrument that's on the list of magical items, which I thought was really interesting. You don't always get great magical item, uh, uh, ma magical musical items. Woo, it's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> There's a there's a pickaxe, right? A war pick or something like that. I think yeah, that's in the, the lineup. There's a, a dwarven uh, a dwarven war hand, or dwarven war pick. A war you... pick, yeah, very cool. Um, I thought that was a really really neat one too. And then we had a we had a, a lot of jokes last night about the Black River, <clears throat> which of course is like a whole a whole thing, or like the that's what it's called, right? The Black River. Yeah. Um, yep. uh, I didn't I didn't get it right. I remembered. Um, and then jokes uh, abounded is, it, uh, regarding the what literal, you can... the literal river. It's a ley line and it's a shadow road. So it has oh, a it lot is of... a shadow road. Okay, so here's I'm well, running. Yeah. I'm Evidently. running shadow courts of shadow fay right now. That's yeah. very interesting to know. Um, I did not know that. Ooh, so, stay out of the river, y'all. <laughs> that makes it a that makes it a real crossroads of weirdness, though. Yeah, so we were joking about what you could brew up out of the black, like what you what you could, what kind of drinks could you possibly brew up using uh -huh. using? Uh, and there were a lot of jokes, but th and then come to find out, there is a literal scarlet mead uh, in the game. Uh, so you know, drinks abound. Um, yeah. Drinks that abound. level, that, uh, the Black River level is also where there are one of the. Uh, again, it was something I've I've wanted to do for a while, and I finally got a chance to do it there, which. Because you go into dungeons and you know ancient crypts and they're full of undead and you just go in and you kill them all right and you destroy them all um, and but this is an area where there are undead there's not necessarily a lot of them but there there are enough and uh, and they don't like each other and oh. you you actually kind of step into 
this ancient war between two groups of undead and it's like you sort of need to pick sides and help one against oh, the other no like, <laughs> you have to you have, you must choose a side well oh that's a way to split a party really fast it's like <laughs> whose side are you on and if everybody doesn't choose the one side man oh man uh hoo -hoo. um and it's not like either one of them is is very good or admirable right, right. <laughs> They're all kind of bad actors, but if you don't, you really can't stay neutral. I mean, I guess you can, but you're not going to come out of it very well. Yeah, say. no, for sure not. Yeah, why kill undead when you can let them kill each other, says Chad. <laughs> yeah, well, if you just stand back and let them do the fighting, then when it's all over, the victor, whoever wins, is not going to have any good feelings toward you. So no, definitely not. Uh, you not want to be on the winning side of that of that conflict. Right. Okay, so this will be my last question before we start taking any last ones from the audience. But this is one uh, that came up last night uh, because V V talked about it and then everybody in chat was like, yeah, what's with that? Okay, we got to talk about Bezors. Is that how you said that? The, the, the Bezor? B-E-Z-O-A-O-R-S, right? And isn't that what it's called? Am I crazy? You're looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> yeah the bezors um uh which is like the witch's walk right uh so i don't know all the things there is to know uh um, it's, a, it's like a consumable magical item right it's kind of like a potion is this the one you were talking about earlier no no this is something else this is actually i didn't write this section <laughs> oh really okay okay so we have been we've been pontificating about like what person, what crazy person came up with this, <laughs> this crazy idea, right? Because it's, um, yeah. So, okay. This is interesting. I, I'm not, I'm not sure who came up with this. This was, this was an add on. This was um, one of the Kickstarter add ons. I think I, I probably came from Wolf. I was about that. to say, I'm, I'll be honest. It feels like a Wolfgang thing. And I can tell you why from this one line right here, it screams Wolfgang to me. Okay, so it is a consumable magical item. We know that much. Right. Kind of like a potion. You swallow it and you gain all I of these effects. I love consumables because you can give them away freely. Me too. I actually, I like consumables that have a purpose. Kind of the way you were talking about magical items. Like, I really love consumables that feed to the story. Because, like, I can give you a ton of, like, like healing potions. But something like this is way more interesting. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I would, I would, you're right. I would put money on the fact that Wolfgang wrote this. A ba it can be removed, so the Bezor can be removed prior to its full duration with a wisdom check, a medicine check, but still deals a secondary damage as you regurgitate it. <laughs> that is a Wolfgang line if I ever heard it. A partially used Bezor recharges itself after being out of the body for 24 hours. So if I'm correct, this thing is like, it's like a parasite. It like lives in the body, right? Sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> Bezor. Bezor. Thank you, Bertman. I appreciate that. Bezor. Um, uh, yeah. yeah and that's kind of the thing. same thing as a cat hairball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, I love consumable things like that. Like, you know, potions and scrolls are, are, have, they're so commonplace now, right? So, yeah, things that I've done consumable magic items that, you know, you, you have to, now again, there's, I've gotten into trouble with this in the past because this is the line that this crosses is pretty obvious, but you know, consumables that you have to snort up your nose. Yeah. Or, like you have you to know, actually take this. Like, yeah. Or, uh, you know, poke into your eyeball or whatever it might be. Or like you say, you know, a bug that you feed into your ear or, yeah, that's, you know, okay. or something that is it, like, it's a, a you know, really disgusting case. It's so bizarre. And there's different versions of it, right? There's like the, the, the bees or, I hope I got that right again. Bees or of the bespectacled something here. There's one for the dire owl bear, also uh, a really cool creature. Looks like there's a great horned owl maybe. Um, so like you get, they're all tied to the owl bear, it seems. Um, I'm slowly figuring yeah, this well, out. Well, so. the, the dwarves who used to live in the Scarlet Citadel were, Big on owl bears. Owl bears, it's yeah. Kind of owl bear genetic breeding program. Yeah, and it's it's basically it's kind of like it is a consumable, but it's actually like a it's like a cursed parasite. Uh, that's the best way I know how to, to like uh, put that into words. It's like a cursed parasite. So really cool. um, we'll have to. I'm still. I'm have to. I guess I'm gonna have to ask Wolfgang who wrote it. Chat. Uh, this has been the mystery since last night of like where this came from and what crazy weird person thought this up in like a fever dream. Um, yeah, so, my yeah. money. 
Nobody's on Wolfgang. <laughs> He's way sicker than I am. It's true. Uh, he looks <laughs> really unassuming and so kind, uh, but he he uh, he crooked. Uh, sometimes I tell him, I was like, man, that's really messed up, Wolfgang. <laughs> I <laughs> uh, love it. Oh, featured in Sandman. It is an okay. I'm learning things. Thank you, Adam. Uh, it is an un, it is an accumulated lump of undigested items. My cat did not like that very much. Um, okay, interesting. Ugh. Uh. So, any last thoughts before we take additional questions from the audience, y'all? This is your time. If you got questions, you best get to asking. Uh, help me out by putting question in front of it in chat so I don't miss it. Um, so I don't miss it. Um, if you're running this game, because I know a lot of you just got your hands on it, talk to us about uh, where you're at, what you're planning, how you want to maybe work it into your home games. You have the literal designer of this game sitting here in front of you. So uh, ask a few questions. Let's see if we can't get them uh, answered for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Now, I have to know, so we talked about like an encounter, really a trap, right? Um, we talked about um, the kind of multiple layers of this, uh, certain levels of the dungeon that are like inescapable and then others where you can kind of retreat back and maybe <laughs> find some solace with some scarlet mead back in town. But what about, what about your beast? What is your favorite monster in this setup? Maybe it's not the monster itself or the beast itself. Maybe it's just the setup for it or the location. Um, off the top of my head, there's a, there's an ogre on level one that I really had fun with it. I, I got a chance to run this, uh, a little bit of the adventure at a convention oh. to a couple of weeks ago down in Dallas, uh, the North Texas RPG con. And I, I ran a little bit of this for some friends and, um, the ogre on, on the first level who is, uh, I mean, he's a, he's a vicious, he, he, vicious monster but at the same time he is uh he's a, a victim of the the main villain on that level who, ah. and, you know, this ogre has been uh subjected to you know unimaginable amounts of of abuse and pain and uh there is a way if if first level characters have to fight this thing the second level characters have to fight this ogre they're, they're just gonna get massacred um but there is a way uh, to uh, to avoid that if mm. you, you know by essentially by being kind to him. Now it, it's not enough to just be nice to him, right? Because he's, 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 you have I will to be shower nice. him with cupcakes. Do not. Right. Do no, it, I will. It, I will. <laughs> you, you need to be nice to him in very specific ways, um, which means that you you. You know, you can't just walk up and you know offer your hand and say, "Hey, let's be friends." That's not going to work. But, um, but if you if you find the right items on the level and you, you know, uh, deal with this ogre in the proper ways, you can. You're not going to make a friend of him, but you can at least avoid having. You can you can avoid getting killed. Getting by him. killed, yeah, yeah, not it's smashed to bits and turned into a jam, yeah. 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 <laughs> and then you know use your use your resources to fight. The, the guy who's really the problem. On right. The so, so I, I quite like, and it's just a, the ogre is, I mean, it's a Scarlet ogre. It's a standard monster out of the Tome of Beasts. I think. Um, so Tome of Beast, uh, another great uh, book for your. Yeah. Yeah. Show. But again, it's an example of, you know, giving, giving a monster a personality and, and some story yeah. that, and that allows it to be something that you interact with on a level beyond just stabbing it. Yeah, yeah, I, I like I, I was talking to V about that last night. It's actually one of the things that I think draws me most to this. Like, I have GM'd a lot of dungeon crawls that are really just like, like Tomb of Annihilation, right? Y'all, right? Okay, dungeon. Uh, there's nothing like showing up back at the beginning naked as a jaybird, right? So like, um, there's there's like, there's dungeon crawls, and then there's something like this that... It is, by all standard definition, a dungeon crawl. But I adore the way that it turns a lot of things a little bit on its head. Like, this idea that the ogre has a personality, and, like, most of the time you don't even question why the ogre is there. You're just going to try to kill that ogre. But the idea that this ogre is kind... Not against his will, but, like, he... He, he has some problems! Like... You might be able to help this poor ogre out or this idea of like 
level three is harsh. You could just TPK the party, or you can go throw their butts into prison and let them, like, suss this situation out um, over an extended period of time, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I really, I just really, really, uh, really like that. Um, but again, it, it all goes back to the idea of the dungeon is a living environment. The, the dungeon is a society, right? It's really no different from the surface world, except that there's no sunlight. <laughs> right, yeah, except, except, you know, no sunlight. Um makes my little it makes my little vampire heart happy um this is a great question thanks cormac for this one how many sessions do you think this might take the average party to reach to get to the end of the day oh boy uh i mean i guess it depends on how long a session is. if you're talking a, a three hour session um it, it, it's going to take a long time some of these levels uh will take quite a few hours um Mm -hmm. And if you're just talking about the basic six levels, um, I would think I would not I would not even want to attempt getting through any of these levels in less than one full session. And that would be the smaller levels. Yeah. Yeah. And I would think at least two three hour sessions per level is probably if you're a low key group that doesn't just charge ahead, well, if if you do have a group that just charges ahead, you're going to be done in four hours because they're all going to be dead. Right, yeah, it's not going to take you very long. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, I can't, I cannot see getting through this in in less than you know three to six hours per level. Per and level. some of them, some of them could take quite a bit more than that i was group. guessing i just like because i was like it was like mm, what if i run this for my private group and i was kind of looking over i'm gonna guess it's gonna take 12 to 15 sittings at two to three hours yeah. piece yeah like uh, just I, based on the way people role play now and shenanigans which you have to start accounting for like you gotta account for as a gm um yeah. the fact that everybody could tpk <laughs> on level three knowing that now is like okay now we might have to be able to rebuild characters or we're gonna do a month's time skip and go this opposite direction you know um i would say somewhere between 12 and 15 sessions i think that's a good that's a good estimate so no uh don't hold me to that chat or do you can come back and tell me i was wrong I'm, I'm used to it by now. Um, and I would add that if, if people, I mean, if they really want to focus on the Scarlet Citadel and not do any side adventures around, then GMs are, you're almost going to have to use milestone advancement rather yes. than XP. Keep characters won't get enough XP to reach level 10 Correct. just by delving in Scarlet Citadel. Yeah. So we do now, include milestones in there. This yeah. next one we kind of cover, but um, I'll ask it though because I definitely think it's an important one. Are there opportunities for role playing throughout the dungeon, or is it mostly focused on combat? And there are. There are like these little nuggets, right? Oh yeah, there's the it, it, yeah a, a party that does not interact with the monsters, that does not role play and talk, and I mean like on I'll throw in level four. There there are things going on on level four that are not even remotely obvious to a group that just comes in and starts killing things yeah um, it's another situation where there are there are actually multiple you know there are three factions on that level and none of them like each other very much and all of them are big enough to crush the pcs yeah. if they don't go in there and make an ally of one of those groups to aid them against the other ones yeah which any of the three groups are reasonably happy to do because they all want to take over the level and run it for themselves. Now, eventually you're going to have to deal with the weakened remnants of your allies. Right. <laughs> it's also conceivable that, you know, if, if players are clever that, that, you know, after they've, you know, erected a new King on level four, that they can just shake hands and go on their merry way. Right. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah, anyone, again, much like level three, it's a very, very different situation from level three, but anyone who just charges into that level is going to just unite these feuding factions against themselves and get absolutely steamrolled. And a, a little bit of a spoiler here, the problem with that is unlike level three, level three 
retreat is not only an option. Retreat is going to be a necessity on level three. Um, players are going to have to pull back and regroup and make multiple forays into level three. Level four, it's a cutoff. When you go from level three to level four, it becomes almost impossible to retreat. So you have, wow. got, you have got to deal with level four on its own terms because uh, there is there is no alternative. Wow. I'm getting nervous again, y'all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as we kind of wrap up here. Uh, so, yes, we're hearing that there are multiple role play opportunities. In fact, it's kind of encouraged um, and necessary for your party to possibly like not TPK out too quickly. But this is a really interesting question, too, because this happens. The kind of glorious thing about a dungeon crawl and all the levels like this is, like, can you remove a level and then run it on its own? And so we had a question about if someone wanted to try to do kind of a massive one-shot, not of the entire Scarlet Citadel, but just one piece of it or one specific level, uh, what might be the best level to do that? Or is there kind of an option for that modularity? I don't even know if that's a word. Yeah, no, you, you definitely could. I would say... Um, any, any of the first four levels could easily stand on their own. Once you get down to levels five and six, they, uh, five and six are kind of tied together in mm -hmm. ways the previous four are not. Um, like level, level six without level five doesn't make a lot of sense. And level five without level six, you could do that. You could do five without six, but it, it wouldn't really feel complete. Mm -hmm. you'd, you'd have to fill in some gaps and it's like, why, why are these people here anyway? But, uh, but yeah, levels one through four, any of those really could be uh, isolated and put wherever you want them. And the same thing with the, uh, you know, the ruined castle up above, that yeah. could be the answer to any dungeon you want. Oh, that's um, a good point. I hadn't even thought about that. This this is the main entrance to the dungeon behind me. Oh, the that's dungeon. cool. Also didn't know that. That's neat. Okay. Um, although I just I just now noticed a, a few minutes ago that uh, the window over here, I, I had not seen this particular illustration before it went into the book. There actually shouldn't be a, there is no window to the outside in that room. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's been drinking the potion. But it does um. look, it does, <laughs> I love that piece of art. I think it's it's a beautiful piece. It's a beautiful piece. Um, all right, we've got two more questions. I'm going to try to get these last two in. One of them should we should be able to answer quickly. Um, starting at first level, what level should the group uh, kind of ideally achieve by ending everything through the campaign? So, like, what is the level suggestion for, for this? this yeah, campaign? the, um, the it, it's geared for levels one through ten. By the time they get down wow. to the bottom, they're, they're going to, the things that they're dealing with on the bottom level are going to require some pretty powerful yeah. character. Now, one of the things with D&D &D is that when you say level, you give a level like that, there's really, like fifth edition is much better than a lot of earlier editions mm -hmm. in this regard in that when you say a level 10 party, you have some kind of idea how much power you're dealing with, but you still, as a GM and as a writer of the adventure, I have no idea how many magic items characters are bringing in. I don't really know, are we talking about a party of three characters or a party of six? That's a huge difference. Um, so GMs, you know, an awful lot lies on the GM's shoulders. They're, you're going to have to adjust things on the fly. And there are quite a few uh, discussions about that in the book saying, you know, if, if, oh, and I would add that one of the things that this adventure does, I was rather proud of, is at the end of every level, there's a short discussion of after characters have come in and cleared this level and gotten through and gone down to the next level, Here's the kind of trouble they can run into if they return to this level. Here are the kinds of things that can repopulate it. Interesting, and, like uh, repercussions. Yeah, yeah. So oh. just because you, you know, if you went through level three and you managed to clear it out and make it to level four and you're down on level four for a few days and now you come back, eh, that doesn't mean level three is still going to be empty. <laughs> oh, there are. Oh. Back in. I like that. The idea that there's kind of like this natural ecosystem inside of the tower. Um, it's still churning, even though like you may have cleared it, but the dust is still going to settle, right? You're going to come back. It's going to be right. dusty again. Uh, so that's, that's, there, that's are, there are even a few things that will kind of hide and let you go by. Yeah. You know, to 
in order to get you on your way out again when you're, they assume you'll be a lot weaker. Huh. Um, all right. Our final question. And I really love this one. I think it's the perfect like wrap up question for you as the designer. What design lessons did you learn in writing this particular dungeon delve? <laughs> uh, well, one of them is the lesson I learn every on every writing <laughs> project, which is, you know, get started putting words on paper as soon as possible. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, right, because, faster. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, because there comes a point where you, you know, at the beginning, all I had to write was a thousand words a day. And, but if you goof around long enough, suddenly you're up to having to write two or 3,000 words wow. a day. And it all becomes a lot harder. But I learned that project on or that lesson on every project. <laughs> um, I, I would say, I actually put a post on Facebook a while ago about this because every time a project is done, you look back at it. And like when, when I, once I got the book in my hand and was looking back at it, that's when you see all the things that in hindsight, it seems so obvious. Why didn't I do this? That would have been so much better than what I did. Not that I don't like what I did, but this other thing would have been right. so Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Uh -huh. And so it, the ideal way to handle a project like this, of course, is to write the whole thing, put it away for a couple of weeks, and <laughs> then come back and, and review it with time to actually make significant changes, um, at significant improvements like that. And of yep. course... On a, on a huge project like this, you just, you never have the luxury of that much time. Um, and honestly, there was probably less of that kind of looking back on this one than on a lot of things because of what we talked about at the very beginning, which was that working with Wolf and outlining what was going to be on these levels. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I still look back at it and I think, you know, I, I could have given the main villain a uh, a more interesting motivation. I could have built his story differently and he would have been a more interesting uh, prime, you know, uh, final boss. Yeah. Uh, but again, it, that's also the kind of thing, I'm a huge fan of emergent story, right? I, I don't like running an adventure off of a script. Yeah. Uh, when I run any adventure that's pre-published, I'm constantly making changes and looking at, ooh, this thing the characters just did, I had no expectation they were going to do that. That, you know, on the one hand, it throws everything else into a cocked hat, but on the other hand, wow, the possibilities from this are fantastic. Yeah. So we'll just change the main villain's motivation to play into that, mm -hmm. and wow, now this just became a much better adventure. So I hope that GMs approach it with that idea and don't feel, you know, tied to right. the words on the paper. And they can say, ah, this, ah. Main villain, this main villain would be much more interesting if he did this in response to something mm -hmm. the player did that Steve Winter did not foresee them doing. <laughs> Well, Steve, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for, one, writing Scarlet Citadel, and two, uh, sharing just a little behind-the-scenes look at uh, that campaign, which everybody you can go get right now over on Cobalt Press. If you back the Kickstarter, you should have access to the PDFs and the VTT content, and hard copies are coming, so be patient with us. You know, the mail's a little crazy right now. Um, and the last question I have to ask is, where can people find you? What you doing? What you working on when you're not uh, over uh, here on Cobalt Press? Um... <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, in terms of, I mean, my social media presence anymore is primarily listed, limited to Facebook because I just don't have time to keep up with you know every uh, uh, every other social media channel out there. But I'm just yeah. Stephen Winter on Facebook, and I'm happy to, uh, and, and I mostly use it just to post you know random idiotic thoughts that pop into my head. I was about to say, well, you already told us that you made a post about one of the topics we were just talking on, so everybody can go check that out and find it um, as well. Uh, thank you again, everybody. Uh, you know me. I'm uh, your resident Cobalt Dot here. Uh, we'll be back. Let's see. Well, of course, we'll be back same Cobalt time, same Cobalt channel next week for another Cobalt Chats. Uh, but make sure to check us out Monday and Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. We've got uh, Courts of the Shadow Fay running on Monday nights and Tuesday nights. You can catch us playing the Scarlet Citadel right here on Cobalt Press. Thanks, everybody, so much for great questions. Um, and let us know if you're out there running the Scarlet Citadel. We want to know about it. Go hit us up on Facebook. Go hit us up on Twitter. Tell us, uh, you know, did you TPK them 
on level three. Uh, did it happen? Uh, are they now in prison? Or, you know, are they now imprisoned instead? Uh, we want to hear all of your shenanigans of how things turn out. And if you missed today's chat, don't fret. You can catch it over on YouTube. If you're watching this over on YouTube right now, we appreciate uh, your eyes and your ears just as much as all of our live viewers. So make sure you follow us so that you can keep up on our content. We'll have more of this kind of thing coming at you uh, as quick and fast as we can make it. So thanks, everybody. Have a fantastic Wednesday afternoon. And thanks again, Steve. Yeah, Bye, everybody. Oh, wait, I'm going to leave you. Our dear, dear Jenny made a new video for us. So enjoy, chat, as we close out our day. <laughs> Bye. Where am I? Welcome, user, to the virtual tabletop, where you can play D&D &D online. Where would you like to visit? Roll20? Fantasy Grounds? Shard Tabletop? Shoot. This is so cool, but I can't play online. I don't have my Kobold Press books. You know, like Deep Magic, my book of more than 700 new spells for every spellcasting class. How am I supposed to play without that? You don't have to. Deep Magic is available on all three platforms. What about the Scarlet Citadel, a classic multi-level dungeon where my players can battle malevolent creatures left over from the days of dwarven mercenaries, strange cults, and sorcerers practicing their forbidden arts? Don't worry, we have that too, and a lot more. Kobold Press makes it easy for players and DMs to find and use their third-party D&D content on whatever VTT they prefer. Monsters, races, backgrounds, subclasses, magic, and of course, settings and adventures. Wow! You really have everything. Affirmative, but what if I get hungry? Just visit the hard drive if you want to grab a bite. Grab a bite. So puns aren't really in your programming, huh? They are in beta.